I would like to welcome you to uh, Centennial Hall, the, uh, one of the newest buildings on Georgia State's campus, which has become the front door of the university. And you can see it's a beautiful facility uh, to hold events like this and to bring together the uh, Georgia State community, our faculty and staff and students, as well as the broader Atlanta community. Uh, and we have our Honors College here and our Welcome Center for new students coming to the university. So this is a very special uh, venue for us and, and perfect for today's presentation where uh, you'll learn about the, uh, one of the most exciting uh, urban development issues that is occurring anywhere in the world. Uh, and uh, it's in our own backyard and we're very honored to um, have the leadership from the Atlanta Beltline here to share with you where we are, what the plans are, and how this will be uh, pivotal in transforming Atlanta in a way that will uh, advance the public health and everyone's um, uh, quality of life. So we're very excited about today and about the um, being here on this lovely uh, fall morning. Uh, let me just say a, a word about the uh, issue of urban health. Uh, uh, it's been about 10 years now that uh, Georgia State uh, decided to fund a uh, urban health initiative. Uh, it was called, uh, it is called the Partnership for Urban Health Research and it was the first initiative uh, funded by the university to uh, invest money in a strategic direction that builds upon the strengths of the university. It's consistent with the mission of the university and uh, will help advance uh, the city of Atlanta. Uh, it was very special and, and over time um, uh, its specialness has been uh, reinforced when we realize uh, the kind of the economics of uh, academia but what the Partnership for Urban Health Research did was allowed us to hire uh, 16 uh, tenure-track faculty uh, new to the university. And we brought them in through uh, a variety of departments uh, from uh, social work to criminal justice to public health to communications and psychology. And so we brought together a team of 16 scholars uh, to advance interdisciplinary research in urban health. And uh, it was really a transformational investment and in something that uh, continues today. And part of that investment was not only the faculty, but also to create this urban health lecture, an annual event where we bring um, uh, expertise from around the country to Georgia State to talk about uh, important issues in urban health. And over the last few years, we've had experts come from around the country, from Michigan and New York City, uh, other places to uh, you know, give their perspective on uh, urban health. Uh, today, we're delighted to be able to uh, reverse that a little bit. Instead of going uh, for an expert uh, around the country and bring them to Atlanta, we have an expert from Atlanta to talk about a national issue of national importance. So we're very excited about today. I want to thank everyone for organizing this event. Just a couple of announcements before we introduce the, uh, uh, our speaker. Uh, first, if you have cell phones, um, uh, we all have cell phones. So just uh, turn it off or put it on vibrate and we can see the smiling faces in the audience who do that. So. Uh, secondly, um, we were asked that if you have, uh, if you brought the, first of all, we want to thank uh, Batdorf and Bronson, the parent company of Dancing Goats Coffee for supplying coffee uh, for, uh, for our presentation for the meeting. And at the same time, if you brought it into this room, please remove it uh, because there's no drinks uh, or food allowed in this, in this room. So uh, thank you for the coffee, but take it outside to uh, enjoy it if you, if you brought it in. And um, uh, let, now I'd just like to introduce John Stewart. John is the coordinator for our, the Partnership of Urban Health Research in the School of Public Health, and I'll introduce our, uh, this morning's speaker. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. Let me also welcome each of you on behalf of the Partnership for Urban Health Research to the seventh annual Urban Health Lecture at Georgia State University. This year, for the first time, 
We have a speaker who does not have public health in his formal professional background. However, our speaker is someone who obviously gets the connection between what he does and the health of the public. He realizes the significance of the health in all policies approach to public health. And in fact, he recognizes health in all programs and all projects. He's responsible for a project that is so important that the eye of the entire nation is drawn to what's happening here in Atlanta today. Paul Morris joined the Atlanta Beltline in July 2013 as the President and Chief Executive Officer. The Atlanta Beltline Inc. is responsible for the development of one of the most comprehensive revitalization efforts in the history of Atlanta and perhaps the history of our nation. Mr. Morris was formally trained as a landscape architect and an urban planner. He spent a 30-year career in consulting and executive management positions focusing on transportation, redevelopment, natural resources management, public parks, and the development of facilities across the nation and in fact around the world. Mr. Morris has assisted communities in 25 U.S. states and 10 foreign countries with his problem solving and dispute, dispute resolution training. His work history has challenging and diverse assignments in cities such as Portland, Oregon, Washington, D.C., Detroit, Michigan, Vancouver, British Columbia, Edinburgh, Scotland, and the United Emirate, Emirate Arab Emirates. Mr. Morris has worked on several projects of national significance, including the World Trade Center Memorial in New York City, the Columbine High School Memorial in Colorado, and the Oklahoma City National Memorial. He's a member of several professional societies and served as the president in 2003 of the American Society of Landscape Architects. Mr. Morris currently lives here in Atlanta. He's married and he has two children, which I'm sure he's very proud of. So let's welcome to the stage Mr. Paul Morris for the delivery of this year's annual Urban Health Lecture. Mr. Morris. told me to knock him dead. Probably not the right thing to do in a public health lecture. <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny, I, for me at least, to look around an auditorium and wonder what it is that drives us to sit where we do. I think there's a, a socialization study somewhere out there that needs to be done that explains our seat selection, right? Uh, you know, it, when I was introduced, the word expert came up a lot, and it often reminds me of something I learned from somebody in high school when I went to a lecture who described for me the definition of expert. And I'm going to break it down for you into its constituent parts as an opening. We all know what X is, right? X is the unknown. And then we all know what a spurt is. It's like water, right, under pressure. And so according to the definition of an expert, I must be an unknown drip under pressure. But I, I actually have a feeling some of you may be aware of who I am and what we are doing with the Atlanta Beltline. And to, for my own benefit, start off my remarks by getting a feel for that, I'm going to ask how many of you have heard of the Atlanta Beltline? Oh, that's good. How many of you have actually been on and spent time on the Beltline? Well, that's not quite as good. We have work to do. Well, obviously, you know and you've heard that what we are undertaking here in Atlanta is, without exception now, one of the most noteworthy urban reinvestment, revitalization efforts happening around the globe. Uh, in May of this year, we received from the International Real Estate Federation uh, at their annual meeting in Luxembourg the best urban rehabilitation project in the world award. So that's... You know, pretty good deal, right? Yeah, that deserves some applause. And I share that with you for a couple of reasons. One, I mean, it's extraordinary to have an institution outside of our country's boundaries taking note of what we here in Atlanta are doing. 
but more importantly that what we are doing that we have always thought is driven by mobility, accessibility, health of both the built and the natural environment, and really raising the bar in terms of health for our citizens to see that an economic entity that cares about real estate would have the same view and that would look at it and really challenge the world because of their belief that the measure of success that we have set is around the reinforcement and the uplifting of humanity. Those were their words, right? This is real estate folks using that phrase. So yeah, it makes you want to pause, doesn't it? And what's important about all of that is that it reinforces for us the conviction that we have and the commitment we all hold in every day that we come to work and think about what our job is. And I want to share with you this morning a little bit of background for those of you who haven't heard it, uh, but to help you perhaps get inside our heads and understand how we think about what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. It is no accident that the Atlanta Beltline and the title of today's lecture is Improving Public Health. Because at our very core, we recognize that is an essential quality of every community, good or bad. And the, and the quality of life that is provided through a great public environment that makes the opportunity for health accessible and casually available is what really distinguishes great communities from the rest. And this is something that has historically not been a part of the makeup, the structure, or even the dialogue, the lexicon of language of this city. In fact, when we launched uh, this last spring our etiquette campaign, which people got a big kick out of, some of you probably saw volunteers on the Beltline talking about um, sharing the road, you know, calling out if you're on a bike, understanding there are going to be kids there, if you are one of the 99.9% .9 of Atlantans who have a dog, keeping them on a short leash rather than on a clothesline. We did that in part because we wanted to connect to our, our community, what I call our peeps. But more importantly, we recognized that the history of Atlanta had never been a, a city of walking and biking. And so the complaints that we were getting were from people largely who had grown up in an environment of walking and biking, whether in the suburbs or other cities and states or countries, and coming here and being frustrated by the lack of etiquette, the lack of awareness. And we realized, well, you can't complain and judge people if the rules aren't known, right? So we, we recognized we needed to be the ones helping to tell the story, helping to build the dialogue and helping to create the expectation, and it has worked. Uh, we don't have quite as many single finger salutes uh, as people are going down the trail. Our rollerbladers, who tend to be even more hardcore than bicyclists, if that's possible, understand that this isn't uh, a motor speedway. It's not the Atlanta Motor Speedway. Uh, but more importantly than anything else, what they're realizing is that in a very unique and unexplainable way, this is where Atlanta is coming together. And we're doing so in a way that really is distinguishing us and making it a really quite extraordinary social and public health experiment. And we do accept that we are kind of in a living, evolving laboratory. And it's a little clumsy, a little bit uh, uh, sketchy at times about what we're doing, but in a weird sort of way, that actually makes it work better, right? It isn't really defined by our expectations. It is systematically a project defined by the community's expectations. And so you're going to hear me talk about the infrastructure and the goals and the, and the efforts that we have underway, but you're also going to see laced with, in that conversation an awareness of what we're doing and why it is so important for us to be listening and obeying the needs of our community, the community of interest and, and for whom the Beltline is their, their home. Now, I have to always start my lecture these days by reminding everybody that Atlanta has always been about mobility. In fact, it may well be America's sentinel around mobility. From its very inception, it's where everything came together and then went somewhere else. So it wasn't really a place to be as much as a place to get through. The railroads used it at its inception. It was called, does anyone know? Terminus. Right? What a great way to talk about transportation and mobility of a city is by calling it that. And it continued through its evolutionary phases. And 
in every way there is good and bad that comes with anchoring yourself around one particular topic. And this is the scene that you might have seen in the 1800s, but this is probably a scene that you see a little bit more regularly today. So not all good comes with this, and where it is devoted solely to mobility, at its grandest scale, it can actually undermine its very intent. And yet, there are vestiges of the early days of Atlanta that continue to drive who we are and how we live, and they show up in the public realm. They show up in those places that we all take pictures of when we talk to others who don't live here about why Atlanta is such an awesome place to be, a great place to live. It's around that place that we gather. It's the social space, it's the public space, it's the nature space. And it is around this that one individual who had grown up, believe it or not, in the suburbs of this region, and while attending Georgia Tech as a graduate student, had his own little aha moment. He was fortunate enough, Ryan Graville, to travel across the globe to spend a year abroad in Paris. And he was frustrated when he came home at wondering at why Paris could have the quality of life, the livability, the public realm, the health, the vitality that it did, and Atlanta did not. And he realized that it was because Atlanta had never provided for it. There were missing pieces in the organization of the landscape, in the provision of the features that are needed in order to create a complete community. And he recognized that it was just, it was more comfortable, Parisians were happier, they, they were more social, and the environment itself was healthier. And he was determined to try to figure out how to crack that code for Atlanta. And he recognized to do it meant doing it in a very unique and singular way. He couldn't adapt what we did, you know, what Paris did, or what other major cities around the world did in evolving over hundreds of years and think that that could just happen overnight here. And yet he knew that there were the makings of the city and he began to unravel them. It's almost like he believed there was an anatomy of the city that needed to be understood that got us to where we were today and made it a vi vital city, made it a successful economy, and made it a place so many people wanted to live. And he understood that a city like Atlanta, that is so well known for being a city of neighborhoods, had a social infrastructure that existed, it just wasn't connected. And so by beginning to unfold the layers, kind of peel, as people say, the layers of the onion away, he began to see that there were all these elements out there and there seemed to be some missing piece. And he discovered something that a few people had noted but never realized could be available. And that was the presence of four old historic railroads called belt lines that were, believe it or not, built by the railroads when the railroads that came into Five Points, which we all know where that is, right? Got tired of the traffic and congestion in, in, in moving their goods and decided to, to build the first perimeter transportation route. And at the time that four, those four railroads were built, they were all independent, they weren't interconnected. That was the edge of civilization in Atlanta as they knew it. Imagine that, right? Two miles from where we sit on either side of the city was the end of civilization. That's their version of the perimeter freeway today. And they knew they still needed to get goods in and out of the city, but they weren't interested in uh, dealing with the traffic that came along with it. So they built the railroads, the mobility of goods movement drove those railroads, but it, with the advent of the interstate freeway system and really the highway system, a lot of that goods movement migrated away from the railroads. Not only because of that introduction, but because the railroads had a funny shift in their business model starting in the 20s and 30s and 40s where they started to believe they were railroads and not transportation companies and it impacted their effectiveness and success, and as a result, they decided to move further out again. And they abandoned these corridors, and they largely disappeared under the kudzu. Many people didn't even know they were living in homes and working in businesses that in their backyard were these old railroads. Ryan did, he discovered it. And his thesis was basically to think that it could be possible to create the new generation of what a perimeter was about, but do it from the heart of the city. 
not on the fringe, and use it as a mechanism to knit together all these features rather than dividing the city and the neighborhoods from each other using public transportation infrastructure to actually unite it, to bring the city together and use public investment as a social mechanism to actually give access to and availability and opportunity for people to come together. Now I will tell you that the history of Atlanta was not very good at doing that. A city of transportation for all of its grand experiments and accomplishments in almost every single case prior to the Atlanta Beltline had actually done everything it could when it built the infrastructure to separate. Whether it was to avoid certain communities and populations or whether it was to cut right through them. And in the process, really never achieved its ambition, its aspiration, right? So we look at the freeway system. We look at the street system. When the belt lines were here, the streets did not cut across them. That wasn't only because the railroads wanted continuous flow. It's because people didn't want neighborhoods on either side of the railroad to connect, uh, neighborhoods on either side of the railroad to connect. But in more importantly than that, it was a recognition that there was a difference between the community that lived here and the economy that thrived here. And that was an intentional act. So Ryan's thesis was essentially in somewhat of an indirect way saying that the health and vitality of the city was tied to connection. To actually heal those wounds and go one step further and use the Atlanta Beltline as essentially the, the tie that binds, that knits the community back together. And so the opportunity for impact was set. And between 1999 and 2005, that single germ of an idea went from a graduate thesis to reality. Organizations were formed, policies were adopted, a basic funding infrastructure was set, and the Atlanta Beltline began to come to life. First in maps and ideas and aspirations, which I often say aspirations are trying to get everyone to do something that hasn't happened before. And then over time, developing into inspiration, which is proving the promise and convincing people that it's okay to do the same thing again, right? And do something different that has, than has ever been done before. And so the Beltline begins to talk about doing that. But it is not solely about that transportation infrastructure, which was for Ryan's thesis really about mobility and accessibility tied to a light rail or streetcar network. It was a transit project, but as it began to unfold, it became evident that there are so many layers of transportation that go beyond transit. Bicycles and pedestrians, trails, parks, green spaces, the rehabilitation of environmentally contaminated industrial sites, largely abandoned all around the corridor when the railroads left. The reintroduction of housing and jobs to the urban core. All of these in their own right elements of the social and economic infrastructure and essential for us to actually have a, a vibrant, healthy environment. And over time, as the community began to get their arms wrapped around it, every one of those elements not only became a good idea, but became a legally binding commitment. So in a very unique way, the Atlanta Beltline went a step further than almost any other government entity. Some of you I know are thinking about your careers in public policy, and there's a subtlety I want to share with you that is, that is significant, in that the Atlanta Beltline not only has the policy goals to do all these great things, but literally has legal obligations to produce 1,300 acres of new parks, 5,600 new affordable housing units, 22 miles of transit, 33 miles of trail, 30,000 new jobs, all within the planning area of the Atlanta Beltline. Every local government seeks to do these things. No one holds them accountable to the numbers or even sets goals of specific numbers that must be reached. That in its own right was an extraordinary accomplishment. And yet, as that happened, the communities began to work together to think about how that might work, and master plans were created. Ten of them to circumnavigate the entire 22-mile loop of these four railroads, whose goal it was to not just create the loop, 
connect the four railroads in a continuously functioning corridor, but to actually go the step further, take head on the challenges that had either been created by prior actions or really avoided or ignored by prior actions and say, we're not going to do this again. We believe for our community to be healthy, for our community to be vibrant, we've got to fill in the gaps. We have to put in the missing pieces. We have to do it in a way that actually looks at every single one of the unique 45 neighborhoods this project touches. And to bring forward the, the interest and the cultural identity of those neighborhoods and give a sense of ownership back to the people who live there. Because if we really believe in the anatomy of a community, then you've got to have healthy people. They've got to be able to live and work and play and shop and learn in places that are within the community. And so it needs the infrastructure to support all those activities. And that's what the Beltline seeks to do. But it goes one step further and it says, as we build that infrastructure, we actually have a role to play in serving those communities' needs and helping them to, provide jo to have jobs. Even going so far as to work with the academy to make sure that at elementary, middle, high school, and even the college level, we're assisting in lifting people up, giving them access to great opportunities and jobs. And then working with the employment sector to actually put the jobs around the Beltline. And then making it possible for people who live there to stay there so that the impacts of gentrification and displacement are managed to the lowest number possible and creating opportunities for them to move there and keep it affordable for folks because anytime you create value, you also create complication. And so while we can't do it all, we do take a commitment of a certain measure responsibility that we can do. And we partner both through the Atlanta Beltline Incorporated, which is the implementing agent, and through the Atlanta Beltline Partnership, which is really the entity that brings it all together and works with the community in all its dimensions to make sure that we have a listening ear and a steady hand in the direction that we're moving. We also recognize at its very core that we were taking something that wasn't just broken, we were taking something that was contaminated. And so for our purposes, the very foundational aspect of what we are doing to reclaim this landscape is to clean up over a thousand acres of contaminated real estate. So we have brownfields on the Beltline. In fact, we pretty much assume any property we touch is dirty. We have our own staff. That's what they do for a living. They manage those efforts. They understand that the impacts of a cent more than a century of economic development bring baggage with it. And our job is to not only create something good, but to fix something that is broken. I like to call that our twofer, right? There aren't many times we get that chance to do the right thing and also to correct something. And the Beltline starts at its core to do that by restoring the landscape, by cleaning up the contaminated properties, and then putting the property back into productive use, both for the Atlanta Beltline uh, improvements in infrastructure and for the community benefits that come with it, whether it's the jobs, the housing, the green space, the parks, the trails, the transit. All of which, as you are starting to hear, are essential components to creating a healthy environment for everybody to live. And then we go beyond that and we want to create beauty. This is a very misunderstood concept, but we choose to live where we do, not just because it's convenient, but because it's beautiful. And if it isn't, by our nature, it is our desire to make it beautiful, even if it is our own home, and to imprint our personality on that place. And so with every single element of detailed design and construction, we talk to the community about what beauty is, both in the landscape and the built environment, and we create very clear design expectations about creating an environment that is beautiful, that is accessible, that over time becomes even more beautiful and more accessible. So everyone gets to be a part of that. So it's, it's about fixing what's broken, it's about making things better. And one of my favorite reasons I love to show this particular slide, and this is only about six months ago on the East Side Trail, is because of who's walking in that picture. People from all walks of life have made the Beltline their own. And we know that's the job, right? If we're really successful, everyone believes it's theirs. How many of you believe you own the Beltline? Okay, the rest of you can now raise your hands. 
Because without you, it wouldn't be happening. Every single one of you, through your voice, through your contributions, through your thoughts, through your experience, through your knowledge, and most importantly, through your use, you make the Beltline yours. But in this particular picture, what's great is the young woman walking down the trail there who just picked up her, her groceries, walking from the grocery store to her apartment or house. You didn't used to think people would do that in Atlanta. Not only that, but likely was told hello or hi by most of the people she passed. Another thing you don't see much in Atlanta, right? Everyone's got their heads down. They're on a beeline to their destination. They're doing that in part because the culture doesn't subscribe to it and the environment doesn't embrace it. It's also important because Frankly, you're not sure whether you're going to end up tripping over a broken sidewalk if it exists. And that, those expectations are essential in order to create the quality of life and the accessibility that is so important to really produce mobility, to make it possible for people to casually get outside, to walk in a healthy environment, and to bring mobility back into their daily lives in a way that is comfortable, easy to do, and you don't have that second thought as you're walking out your door. Is this the way I'm going to get to the store or to work today? The other thing that's important to us is to not lose sight of the history. And so we constantly reclaim elements, whether it's in the built environment through the old Ford factory lofts, which is now housing, or in the infrastructure environment, where we try to reclaim historic infrastructure, whether it's bridges or tunnels or other elements of the landscape that were a part of what made Atlanta what it is. And to make it new, and exciting and accessible for the community that wants to live and use it here today. And we go one step further and we reinvent people's expectations about what's possible. In buildings, in warehouses that were largely abandoned, broken down, windows uh, knocked out, in many cases burned up, by the old method and thinking of development would have just been raised, right? Old buildings, structurally deficient, Ah, it's easier to just tear it down. On the Beltline, we don't do that. We try to repurpose and bring back to life everything that is a part of the history of the city. And this particular corridor is now one of the most vibrant parts of the East Side Trail. These buildings house some of the most successful restaurants, including Kevin Rathbun's Steak, which is on your left. Not only in the city of Atlanta, but one of the most well-known chefs in America, who chose to move his next restaurant, and now has two restaurants within about a quarter mile of each other on the Beltline. And when asked in January how his business was doing since this segment of the trail had opened, said it had improved by over 300%. He sells more food on the patio than he does inside the restaurant, which most restaurants will tell you is not possible. They want a captive audience where they're close to the waiters and waitresses and can see the food being cooked. And yet, why would people want to be outside and spend more time? Not but for the fact that the Atlanta Beltline is there. And that it has become this gathering place. And it has become this economic vital place. And it has become an environment that is healthy for many people to use. But we also recognize that it has to be transformative on a larger scale. And so in many cases it means really taking on the hardest challenges. Many of you may not know this, but as little as five years ago, the East Side Trail, the area around the old historic Fourth Ward neighborhood, was actually documented by the Atlanta Police Department as one of the three top crime zones in the city. Not a great banner headline. And yet today, we can count on two hands the number of crimes that happen around the Beltline and in the parks and open spaces that are there. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and, and Tom Sebelius will probably fact check me on this, was actually quoted at one point as saying the only redeeming qualities of the area around which the old Sears building existed, the only redeeming quality was the industrial kind of chic of old broken down and thrusted concrete left over from when the buildings were broke, torn out and abandoned from industrial uses. That was its one redeeming quality. That particular effort launched a very different thinking for the Beltline Incorporated that where we were involved 
that had already been launched and became really a guiding principle for the Atlanta Beltline Partnership, which was, this, which was this notion of partnering to really overcome what it takes to rehabilitate the urban environment and bring public health and vitality back. And that's by working together at the local government, the state government, the federal government level, across institutions, and ironically even within institutions, where the city's departments of parks, public works, planning, watershed management, transportation, all did their own thing, but rarely together. And in a very unique instant, we were able to take this old site and turn it into what is now the historic Fourth Ward Park, which continues to get awards almost monthly for its extraordinary accomplishment, for the jewel it has added to the environment of Atlanta as a part of that 1,300 acres that we're building. But in its real purpose, is designed to separate stormwater from sewage in a city that was documented as one of the worst combined sewer overflow cities in America, another health initiative, and do so in a way that did not force us to build a big vault and pipes underground. And instead said, you know, we can do this better. We in Atlanta have the potential to make a greater place. And so what you're really looking at here is a stormwater detention facility. And in fact, is where people have their weddings. So how many people, how many women, if you're looking for wedding sites, would put stormwater detention site on your list of candidates? And I get the pleasure with regularity of authorizing weddings at the historic Fourth Ward Park. I've been accused of questioning whether people were counseled beforehand, before I signed. It's a rumor, don't believe it. But what's so extraordinary about it is what it is doing in terms of community and recognizing that every part of what we do, we have the opportunity, I would go so far as to say the obligation, to actually rethink the assumptions about how we heal the urban environment from decades, from 100 years or more of kind of blow and go, build and move on mentality, and instead say we can do it better, and more importantly, we can do it cheaper. The Watershed Department, under a stipulated order from the Environmental Protection Agency, was charged with having to separate this, deal with the stormwater that not only was combined with sewer, but that was flooding the old Sears building every year. So imagine what that must have been like. And do so in a way that was going to cost them 40 to $50 million. Through a unique partnership of all those departments, working with the state, with the federal EPA, and with the private sector, and with the neighbors around the neighborhoods, we came up with a plan to create a beautiful park and essentially disguise this huge basin, this bathtub, as a lake. So when you go there today, what you're actually standing in and around is a stormwater facility. And it actually has the capacity not only to handle the annual floods that happened, but a 100-year flood and a 500-year flood. In fact, I, I, I suggest that you go out to the park and, and look at the big stone wall, and on it you'll see two little bands of river rock, about a foot and a half or two apart from each other. Those actually depict the 100-year level of water and the 500-year level of water. In 2009, when we had the huge storms that caused all the flooding, it didn't even reach the level of the 100 years. But what you're looking at in this scheme is all of that's designed to be underwater, and yet the plants that are there, the selection of materials that are used, the care that is used, is all designed to allow nature to heal itself, to take care of itself. More importantly, what it did is it, it opened up the opportunity for economic development on the old Sears building. And now, yesterday, I got to be one of hundreds of people to watch as Athena Healthcare, who had lived in a suburban office park in Alpharetta, relocated their regional headquarters to this building in what was one of the most extraordinary transformations and shifts in thinking around how office development happens in this region. And we cut a ribbon yesterday. They moved in and they're now across the street from this park. How many of you think that people want to work at Athena Healthcare? It's extraordinary and they, are, they have told us that three years ago when they did a scatter study of everyone that worked in Alpharetta, less than 10% of their employees lived in the downtown area of Atlanta. They all lived out on the perimeter, they lived in Alpharetta, and some even further north. Uh, two weeks ago, they did an update, and they're now at 33%.
And they estimate within the next two to three years, they will see almost two thirds of their employees living within walking and biking distance of their offices. They'll have access to work, to healthcare, to restaurants, to grocery stores, to parks, everything they need. In fact, because of the redevelopment of that site, they will have housing, retail, restaurants, and office all in the same building. They may not even have to leave the building. We want them to get on the belt line. But we heard, as their CEO said yesterday, that one of the deciding factors on their commitment and willingness to come from Alpharetta into the city was a willingness of Jamestown Properties to ensure that they would have trail access onto the belt line from their building. That was part of their deal. What does that tell us, right? There's something bigger going on here. And that something bigger takes partnerships. And so Rob Bronner's here this morning. He's going to join me for Q&A. The partnership has really been the compass that's kept us on track. Through hundreds of volunteers, through thousands of supporters, through 50 and 60 and 70 different organizational partnerships on everything from health activity around the Beltline to the running series to caring for the Beltline to building the Beltline, the private sector, both philanthropically and systematically and institutionally, are engaging in and bringing their mission to Atlanta through the Beltline as their canvas. And the partnership working with us makes sure that we're in alignment as two very unique and distinct entities in this city. And we are learning across the country, working side by side to ensure both the physical improvements and the economic development happens at the same time, the social benefits, the things that really bring the community together and make it a viable project happen as well. And at our very core is that health vision. The notion that in a very unique and very simple way, we're creating a, a landscape that people can have fun on, that they can get together, they can walk, they can bike, they can play, and they can be active. We know that in an age of chronic disease in which obesity is at its highest in our country's history, and Atlanta and Georgia has the unfortunate distinction of being one of the states that leads the way, we have the potential to create opportunities for that to change. And we aren't doing it passively. We have our own health steering committee that the Atlanta Beltline Partnership hosts with all of the obvious namesake individuals, including Georgia State University's College of Public Health at the table, the Centers for Disease Control, and many others at the local and national level, including the medical uh, in, uh, facilities like Kaiser Permanente and Grady Health Systems, talking about what is it we need to do to engage to help people be more active. Knowing that 50% of the issue around obesity can be solved through behavioral change. That's a big number. So every little bit we do has huge transformative impact. And we go and we learn from what the public tells us. And so we do things like making it a healthier and more active community for everyone to be a part. We have what we call nutrition walks or walks with the docs, where, where doctors from Piedmont Hospital actually walk the Beltline to give people advice about how to be more healthy, to eat better, to exercise more, and do so in a way that unbeknownst to the people that are doing it are actually being and getting healthier on the spot. So I'll admit there's a little bit of Machiavelli in us. We, are, we do have ulterior motives. The walking tours, the bike tours, even the bus tours are all designed to introduce the idea to people that the Atlanta Beltline is theirs, that it can be an opportunity for lifestyle change, for cultural change in a community that never thought that walking and biking was a part of the culture, to really make an accessible, comfortable, enjoyable experience, but also make sure that they, it is a healthy experience. And we go one step further and we recognize that if 50% of the problem is behavioral change, we know that at least 50% of the problem is also nutrition and being able to have access to healthy eating. And so not only do we create our own urban farm network, which we're building, but we partner with a whole suite of healthy eating institutions, organizations, and, uh, and entities for the purposes of giving knowledge and access to folks who want to have community gardens. In a city that actually had eliminated the ability to have community gardens for decades had to change city law, it was against the law in Atlanta, and put that back in place, and is still trying to figure out how to do that. 
Now we have the unique distinction because the belt line is private. We can show them how. And we can make it possible to kind of eliminate all the anxieties around you know, what that might do and show that having access to healthy food and produce on a daily basis is not just an opportunity, it should be a right. And it should be something that everybody can enjoy. And so we do that whether it's providing technical guidance through the extension service and our own efforts to communities that are trying to build events and parks and, and gardens in their own neighborhoods, but even doing stuff institutionally in our own work where we introduce edible landscapes into the built environment. And going a step further to where we actually start to monitor and understand what we're doing. So the Health Steering Committee has a multitude of activities that they're addressing to try to figure out how it can be a connector to health. How the Beltline can actually introduce not only what it is to be successful, but create benchmarks and monitor progress and, and provide continuity to people who take the test to pass the test and then begin to make that a lifestyle change that's a part of their efforts, whether it's in the schools, whether it's in the community at large, or whether it's within organizations, institutions that want to have access to walking and biking and public transportation. And we recognize that our efforts are working. The East Side Trail, which is about two and a quarter miles, built and opened about two years ago, now this year will document almost a million users. That puts it on the scale of the world of Coke and the Georgia Aquarium. And on the face of it, it just looks like a 14 foot wide, two mile long piece of concrete. But when you're out on it, you recognize there's something else going on. There's a lot more that's really making it a place that is healthy, that's accessible, that is social. And so all the elements that make it possible for us to be a community of interest are available to everybody. But it goes a step further and it makes it possible to actually live there. So you don't have to take that decision point and put yourself in a car to get to work from where you live or to get to home from where you work. That opportunity is afforded for people to actually live and work and use walking and biking and eventually transit to really be a part of their lives. And we go a step further with many of the partners that the partnership brings to the table in all arenas and that we sponsor recreation and exercise free to residents. I mean, that just doesn't happen in most places. And hundreds of people come out to be a part of these on a daily and weekly basis to with new people they've never met before of all age and income and ethnicity saying, you know, this is just what we do here in Atlanta. This is who we are and making healthy behavior just a part of the social fabric and making walking and biking part of the social fabric of the neighborhoods. Some of it is organized in ways that is fun and spontaneous in other ways, right? Kids showing up for play day and street cup. They don't have to get their parents' permission. They don't have to sign up and fill out a bunch of paperwork and wait six weeks for confirmation. We sponsor it, we advertise it, we use technology to make sure everyone knows about it, and then the kids come out and enjoy it. And they get to see that parks are a place that's safe, that's fun, that's inviting. And they get to meet other kids in their own neighborhood. And we begin to build a whole new layer of fabric and opportunity for everybody. But I do not want to leave you without saying that the infrastructure itself also serves an important purpose. And I want to anchor it in a study that was done by research physicians in Charlotte when the, uh, the Charlotte uh, Lynx light rail transit system opened. They actually, and I'll give you a very crude overview of this research paper, which if you're interested afterwards, I can give you the link to. They followed a cohort of about 1,800 people for about 18 months prior to, and then 18 months after the opening of this initial leg of their transit system. Because they wanted to monitor the health effects that it might have. And the bottom line is that the result of that was an average, weight loss of six and a half pounds of that population. Reduced BMI and a healthier outlook on life. And the only cohort of change that occurred in that 18 month to 18 month cycle were three things. Beautiful landscapes, accessible safe sidewalks, 
and ready access to a light rail transit system that would give them increased mobility so they didn't have to drive. The beautiful thing against all criticism that peaked when people said, well, yeah, but you attracted all these people, right? And they were young people. They changed the demographic was actually false. Not only was it a fixed cohort of people that they followed through that whole 30 to 36 month period, average age was 52. Goes to show you can teach an old dog some new tricks. It also goes to show that you cannot believe the myths about as we age, we don't want, we want to be sedentary. We don't want to be outside. We won't change how we move. And in fact, Given the opportunity with a beautiful, accessible, and reliable mode of transportation and an environment that they can walk and feel safe in, we all will take that choice and we will make those decisions. So on all the issues that we talk about and the modes that everyone talks about and the purposes of bringing transit to the Atlanta Beltline, who would have thought that public health would be one of our greatest accomplishments? But we go the step further and we do appeal to the hardcore bicyclists and even the casual bicyclists with bike tours and other events that go on. The health steering committee is beginning to measure for us by benchmarking and using our own reference points, what we're doing, and figuring out new ways to introduce value and interest to all the community so that we begin to know how healthy is our community and are we doing what we can to help them improve their health along the same lines that we're improving the health of the environment. The, the engagement of that process is organized by the experts, which I'll admit I'm not, but I'm smart enough to know what I don't know, and I hope with the help of the partnership, we're always smart enough to go find the people that do. And so we, whether it's health or anything else that we're doing to bring the social, the health, the vibrancy, the environmental benefits of the land to this project, we're going to those that do it best. And we're bringing them to the table and making their mission our mission. We like to say with a 22 mile loop that encompasses 15,000 acres and almost 20% of the city's landscape, we've got room to try things. And we've got a pretty cool expansive landscape, we call it our canvas, to bring the residents and resource partners to the table and help them help us figure out how to make the Atlanta Beltline something that no other city has ever done. And you can see the wealth of institutions that have stepped up with that simple opportunity, that simple ask, and said, yeah, we're in. We think this is a great opportunity to do something others aren't doing. And more importantly, we think it can be a conduit to changing the way we actually do our own job. That we can advance what we're trying to do and raise the bar of excellence in everything we do. We love our fitness classes, whether you're into yoga, 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 I didn't have breakfast this morning, let me see where my brain is, uh, whether you're into yoga, yoga or other exercises, I still can't get that off, somebody got some yoga in the room, uh, everyone comes out and does it, some multi-generationally, and being able to tell extraordinary stories about weight loss, about healthier living, about reduced uh, issues of, of diabetes, and really just a more active mind, a more engaged community, and, and an opportunity for people to really be a part of each other's lives. We have a running series, which is also another effort to reach out to and involve as many new and different people as we can. People come from all over the region for our four different road races around the Beltline. We have two 5Ks, a 10K, and we just had our Southeast 8K, our last race of the year. And our whole goal there is to make it fun and inviting. Some of them are free. This one, you actually get to do something a little bit more official. But our real excitement comes when the community comes together without us telling them. Five years ago, as part of our launching of Art on the Atlanta Beltline, which was designed to show people that the Beltline was something they'd want to get onto, we launched this little temporary exhibition and in its second year, one of the artists submitted a proposal and said, well, we don't want fixed sculpture or murals. We want to do something interactive. Could we have a little parade? There, there are lantern parades around the world that have been done. And so a few people got together. We, we agreed to let them try it. 
And before we knew it, there were hundreds of people walked the Beltline as a kickoff to the Art on the Atlanta Beltline exhibition the first Saturday night in September. By the third year, which was two years ago, that number had reached over 1,000. Without almost any formal marketing or advertising, last year we broke 10,000. And the image you're looking here today is actually of people on the Beltline, many with their own lanterns, this one, an actual lantern built by a special effects studio here in Atlanta that was so in love with the Atlanta Beltline's lantern parade, they manufactured a space guy and had him floating above the crowd, all lit up, just for the sake of being a part of it. And this year, we had more than 23,000 people show up on, this, on a Saturday night. And what did they do? They walked. Most of them, four miles. They had to walk the whole length and back. Many of them five and six miles to get to their homes and their cars. Never once thinking I'm exercising. In all these efforts just creating an environment that promotes health and creates a really fun, invigorating and inspirational environment to do that. Everyone becomes a part of it. The businesses become a part of it. The art community becomes a part of it. Even musicians become a part of it. This year, as part of our Honor uh, the Atlanta Beltline uh, series, we're having performances in many of the parks, many of them designed to be interactive with the community that visits them. Last weekend, we had almost two weekends ago, 400 people who just showed up on Sunday for an event at Fourth Ward Park, others over at Gordon War uh, White Park, some now at Adair Park, and others in all sectors of the city. Our commitment is while we buy and build this all out over 25 years, we're constantly working all around the Beltline, making it accessible to every neighborhood, all 45 neighborhoods, and we're working on every element as we do it. But at the end of the day, we are constantly reminded that it is yours, and you need to know that it's yours. And so this summer, we finally launched, after two years of getting beat up by all of our social buddies, our own app. So. While you were told to turn all your phones off, this is that one moment where you can pull your phone out and you can click on uh, the app at iTunes and, and download a free Atlanta Beltline app and plan your trip. Know what to, what's coming up, where you can exercise, where you can eat. Find your way around Atlanta all through a simple technology that really is designed to use technology to help us be active, not the other way around. And in the process of doing all that, realizing that if it is really yours, and if these legions of partners are so essential, how are we gonna do that? But for having a plan that is clear, that is prescriptive, that is scheduled, and that everybody understands we need your help to implement. So last December, our board of directors unanimously adopted our first ever strategic implementation plan. Even though this started eight years ago, we were still operating off that first redevelopment plan from 2006. And yet we knew if we were really going to be committed and move from the aspirational to the inspirational, we had to be all in. So we completed it, we adopted it, and we are now implementing the first period of three periods over the next 17 years that will fulfill the promise that everyone believes in to ensure that this project comes to fruition. Our first period is very detailed. It works all around the Beltline on all components at the same time, which makes our job a little more complicated, but it allows every one of you sitting in this auditorium today to find something you care about to be a part of, to help advance as part of this program. And it does so in a way that brings every feature element that we're learning through all of our efforts, whether it's in recreation or health or economic development, to the table and moving it along that says, at any given moment, something more can happen in that space. And we have a place that we're working on to make it happen. Many of the parts of this project are easy to work on because they're small or we can break them down into small pieces. The one that's the most ambitious, the one that is the most complicated, and yet the one that we know from a health standpoint now has some of the greatest value is to put in place the light rail streetcar. And make sure that it isn't just a cultural uh, entertainment facility connecting the, the Martin Luther King National Historic Site and, and Sweet Auburn to Centennial Olympic Park and Peachtree, 
but in fact becomes a network that allows every one of us to know that as we walk out our door, whatever that door is, we have the ability to know that there is a mode of transportation that gets us that last mile. So we can walk our bike and put our bike on the train and get to work. Or we can go out and have a great time and know that we'll get back home because the streetcar will be there to help us get that last mile. So we are currently working, and this is in a bold, ambitious partnership with the Federal Transit Administration in the state of Georgia to advance the initiative to actually finalize where those routes will go. And we're starting right off with extending the current streetcar that is going to start tomorrow. Is it today the 30th? Tonight, we'll start operating on its own power. And know that that's not enough, right? And everyone is saying, when is it coming to the Beltline? And so our goal is to figure out quickly how that and where that will be, and begin to pursue the financial support at the local and federal level to implement that next stage of the Beltline. Building something this grand, this ambitious, this audacious, doesn't come without challenges. And it comes with its share of disbelief. And we hear from people pretty regularly, this is, you know, the odds are against you, right? The odds are too great. And we agree, you know, in a simple term, the odds are probably 60 or 70%, maybe higher, that something like this would never happen. But this is a city and a community who have made decision after decision over the last 15 years from Ryan's first thesis to say we're going to work against those 50 to 60 to 70 percent odds and we're going to choose to believe in the 20 to 30 to 40 percent odd that we're going to make it happen you who are the naysayer you can go down your path and believe in the odds that say no we're going to believe in the odds that say yes but we all have to contribute to that if we want to make the odds that are low the reality and so we have to get funding to build elements as we go and in many cases, while the base funding we have from a tax allocation district gives us a foundation, we have to leverage that through participation in local, state, and federal government grants, through extraordinary philanthropic contributions from the private sector, who were it not for their initial funding of $40 million, I wouldn't be standing here today being able to tell this story. And they continue to give. In the last six months, they've raised another almost $10 million to help us implement the next phase of three miles on the west side. And they continue to believe in this because they believe in the quality of life that it's bringing to the city. They believe that this is the fabric that's been missing from our landscape. And in order to create a complete community, the Atlanta Beltline will be that, that fabric, right, that brings us all together, that in fact unites instead of divides. And they also know that people are gonna have to be able to get to where they work, people are gonna have to get to where they shop and play, and it won't be enough to force them into their cars to do it. Or accept that just this beautiful 22 mile loop will meet all our needs. But we have to have a network that reintroduces 66 miles of streetcars into a city that at one time had one of the largest streetcar networks in America and was one of the last to take it out. So some historic lessons are actually intended to be repeated, right? Somewhere along the line, we did throw the baby out with the bathwater, and it's time to get it right. And so this is really intended to fill that gap. It complements how we walk and bike. It complements how we use the metro system at a regional level for commuters. And it provides that extended day. It gives us the ability to be wherever we want in Atlanta and know that we can get around. And as a part of that, we had to create an, a system plan that actually would tell us, in alignment with our strategic plan, how we hoped to implement it in phases. So we don't have to build the network all at once. It can be done in steps. And it's important to do it leg by leg, learning the lessons as we grow. So we've learned a lot even building the first leg that's informing the next leg. But each leg will be connected continuously so that the system and the network grows and gets bigger. And that same thing is now our, our philosophy and policy for the trails and the, tra and the parks uh, and the green spaces. In this particular diagram, you see the 22 mile loop and our connector trails. The green is what we have today, believe it or not. It isn't just the east side trail. We've got the West End Trail and the Tanyard Creek Trail and the Southwest Connector Trail, all of which provide continuity and connectivity. But we're not stopping there. We're beginning to now connect to those trails and begin to close the loop. 
with the ambition and expectation in our long range plan that our goal will be within the next 24 months to have control of the entire 22 miles. Imagine the moment you would be able to safely and legally walk that entire 22 mile rail loop. And what's exciting not only about that is that in addition to it being continuous, it will be the only flat place in Atlanta that you can walk 22 miles. <laughs> so that takes a little bit of the grief and anxiety out of going for a walk or a bike. But we're also going one step further and we're adding the extensions and constructing them, not just buying them. So this fall and into this winter, we will start construction of another mile on the south side, extending from Irwin Street, for those of you who've been on the Beltline, down to Memorial Drive. And the beauty and the accessibility is coming along with a lot of development. And housing and jobs are coming as well. And we're doing the same on the west side. The partnerships commitment of $10 million linked with a unique grant called the Tiger Grant from the US Department of Transportation's Highway Administration brought us to the funding we needed to build $43 million worth of improvements and another three miles on the west side. So we're really starting to gain momentum and do so in a way that not only makes it accessible, but really completes all the needs that we have. So it won't just be like on the east side where you have two and a half miles or two and a quarter miles with access points at the end and one or two in the middle. We're actually gonna have 16 access points connecting to all the neighborhoods. It will be so penetrable that it will essentially be easy to get on and off wherever you need to. And we, that was one of the lessons we learned on the east side is that it isn't enough to have the walk. It needs to be that connective tissue that does unite us. And it will be beautiful and it will be transit ready. As you go on the east side, you see that area that's really kind of rough and partially landscaped. That's actually where the transit will go. So you'll have the, the trail and landscape on one side, landscape and the streetcar on the other and it will become this great multimodal corridor linking all the parks and other things together. And we'll do what we did, what we learned from the first phase along the southeast side near Kevin Rathbun Stake, and we will seek to restore, repair, and repurpose old historic buildings. And in this case, the old state farmer's market. Believe it or not, that used to be in the city and is now tens of miles south of the city. And we are getting to acquire and have just completed the transaction. They actually turned the keys over to us to repurpose that and bring that back to life as a mixed use, open space, jobs and housing site right next to our first urban farm on the Beltline at the terminus of the next phase of our project. And we're continuing to work on our parks as well so that not only do we get the joy of seeing D.H. Stanton and Historic Fourth Ward Park and Skate Park but bringing more of those parks to all of the community around the Beltline so that we have great places for people to play, great places for people to exercise, and where health will continue to be a centerpiece of everything the Beltline does. Thank you so much. Now, I think we've been told that there's time for a few questions if people have them. Yes, on behalf of the Partnership for Open Health Research Steering Committee, I'd like to thank you all for attending and thank Mr. Morris for his talk. And we have microphones on both sides down front if you would like to come up and ask either Mr. Morris or Rob Vrano, who is here as well from the partnership, um, questions about the Beltline project. Thank you, Mr. Morris. That was an excellent talk. Um, Mike Lenny, a MPH candidate here at the Georgia State University. Um, as a avid cyclist, a public state or a uh, public health student, I can definitely appreciate the ability for active transportation to improve both personal and community health. Um, and then getting more towards the ethereal but still very real ideas of, of community fabric and, and social well-being. Um, I, I appreciate uh, you speaking to that. And the picture of the Lantern Parade, I think, is, a, is an excellent example of how we can really kind of knit some of these communities back together uh, with your project. <clears throat> I have personally invested in, in this vision. Um, last year, we, we bought a house, ITB, 
or inside the belt line. Um, uh, I like that. That's good. With the, with the um, hope that we will have um, transport alternatives and options in the future that um, will improve our quality of life. For anyone in the room that does not know, there is a uh, development in the southeast Atlanta that uh, some would argue is, is directly at odds with the, the vision of what Mr. Moore spoke about today. And so what I would, would like to ask you is if you could speak to any of the lessons that you and your organization has learned, and then furthermore, if you can give any recommendations for the, the next generation of policymakers in the room um, for dealing with organizations whose ideals might be not quite as altruistic as yours. Well said. Uh, we have learned a lot of lessons. One of the biggest is when you do something really good, everybody wants to own it, but they may not all want to own it the same way. And the Beltline is one of these things with so many fibrous connections to so many interests that uh, the somewhat uh, curious need for adopted plans and policies becomes essential. And I put it in that context because Atlanta in its history has not been a city of planning. It's been a city of building. And it didn't turn out bad. I mean, you could have conversations about the effects of sprawl, but that happened all over the country, and yet, if you look at the armature, the anatomy of the city itself, the historic city, it's quite an extraordinary place. And yet, as the Beltline was being developed and the thought was being put on paper, the initial thought was, if we get these master plans done and the city puts in place an overlay district for the 15,000 acres that structures how things will look, we'll be good. At some point, we may have to rezone. That was probably the thing they shouldn't have said because what has happened is the momentum of the economy is attracted by this public commitment. And that's an important lesson. When communities come together and make, make their commitment and stake their claim to improve the public realm, the private sector always follows because that predictability and that quality is what anchors the value of their projects. Unfortunately, having not gotten all the zoning done to match the master plans, the zoning that existed on many of the properties and still does today is industrial zoning, which pretty much allows anything. Now, we could tell you how it looked because the overlay district was in place, but that zoning didn't get done fast enough. So the city, now working with the Atlanta Beltline Incorporated, uh, is actually putting in place what they call proactive rezoning to actually bring the zoning up to the standards. Oh, thank you. Um, I was a little glary there, uh, to match all the 10 master plans that link the Beltline together. That was a big lesson. I think the other lesson is, and we learned this really listening to our board of directors led by Mayor Reed, that we need to be more proactive, coming in on the front end before development happens and influence the quality and character and identity of that development in a way that brings value back to the people who invested in the project. So that Believe it or not, when, when developers build, there's a lot of value they get to claim that they didn't invest in, right? And that value equation, that value creation, somebody gets. And the city and the mayor are saying, we gotta share that. We put it in, how come they're getting it all out? And one of the ways we do that is by coming in on the front end, in some cases actually acquiring the real estate and steering the development, in other cases, serving as kind of a gating function to ensure that the form and nature of the development, the uses, the design of the development, and its consistency with the neighborhood expectations, and a design excellence standard that our board, through the mayor's leadership, has directed us to have, will ensure that we have a better chance of avoiding some of those past lessons uh, and not having to repeat them. Those are too big to your specific point. Well, that was excellent. Uh, I've got a question for uh, Rob Bronner and uh, you, Paul. How can the people in this room get involved in the Beltline? What suggestions do you have if people have personal interest in the Beltline, either from the standpoint of academia or as a member of the Atlanta community?
Thanks. Um, there are tons of ways that you all can get involved. Um, specifically around health, uh, you can get out and use our free fitness programs, bring a friend, encourage healthy behavior, help us move the needle um, in neighborhoods around the Beltline. From a more academic standpoint, I mean, as has been referenced in, in Paul's conversation, we have Dr. Jackie Lund and we've got uh, John and many others from uh, Georgia State who are actively involved in our Atlanta Beltline health movement um, at some of the different levels that uh, were up on the, the screen a while before. So at a strategic level, um, we have a steering committee. We have you know, lots of need for uh, measurement of health outcomes over time. Uh, again, uh, John is, is leading our measurement committee for um, our, our overall um, Atlanta Beltline health movement. And then we also have you know, program partners. We're hoping to have um, a number of uh, students help us in actually delivering our fitness programs. We've been working with uh, Laura Abbott in the kinesiology department um, and uh, one of a grad student, Allison Henley, who is actually in the process of taking over the day-to-day -day management um, of our free fitness programs to actually have those managed under Georgia State. And I think there will be lots of opportunities through that. I mean, obviously we're excited to have a wonderful partner um, who can you know, help us logistically, but I think the real benefit's gonna come in the long term with that, those programs being housed here, that gives us a, a phenomenal opportunity to start tying into different departments and, and let you all kind of figure out, wow, we've got these fitness programs, we can learn how to you know, measure health things, do research, et cetera. So I think there'll be a lot of opportunities um, through that as well. Uh, so those are kind of on the health side. And then certainly, certainly just through the partnership, generally we have um, a number of opportunities for you to learn more about the Beltline uh, through our various tour programs. We have opportunities to uh, help volunteer and, and teach about the Beltline. We would love to have students who are helping us get the word out on campus uh, about the Atlanta Beltline and, and what's coming. And so uh, through our volunteer efforts, beltline.org slash volunteer, we can certainly uh, get you connected with that. We have our adoption program. Uh, if there were a Georgia State group that wanted to come out and help take care of a quarter mile of the Beltline, we would love to have you all engaged in that. So we've, we have literally dozens of, of different ways that student and faculty uh, from Georgia State could help us. Hi, thank you for a great presentation. Um, I had a few questions about um, your strategies for ensuring equitable, equitable access to affordable housing because as I'm sure many people in the, in the room as well as you know, the, the significant associations between housing and health. Um, so I'm interested to know what strategies you all have in place to okay. ensuring. So the question has to do with equity and affordable housing. What are our strategies? Uh, in the original redevelopment plan was a directive that it was our responsibility to help create 5,600 workforce affordable housing units. So this isn't low income, but it's for renters, it's at 60% and below of AMI. Uh, and for purchasers, it's 80 to 20, 120% of AMI. Uh, and all around the Beltline. Uh, and so that became kind of the minimum requirement, but since then we have worked toward a number of objectives. One is not only do we want to create that affordable housing, but we want to create so much housing that overall housing prices come down. And so we're actually working to create 30 to 40,000 housing units around the Beltline. That's a lot of new housing in a variety of income levels. Everything from studio lofts for affordable means to affordable single family and attached and condos to market rate housing in all levels all the way up to, and believe it or not, including executive housing on the Beltline, which when I first started talking to that, I will, help, I will assure you people looked at me funny. But I'll tell you why I did it. Because we listen, we learned from executives at events I would go to who would come up to me afterwards and say, I love the Beltline, but I'm never going to live there. And I was a little bit kind of taken back by that, and my next question obviously was why? And they said, because there's nowhere for me to live. And I'm thinking, okay, well there's always, you know, Ansley Park, there's Morningside, there's, I mean, there's options, and they're like, yeah, so I get to have to walk or bike a mile when others don't have to? And I was reminded later that the single most significant decision in employers locating their business is what? where their bosses live. And if I'm not creating an opportunity for executives to live on the Beltline, 
then shame on us. Because we have now said to them, we don't want your business. Because that is their logic. So everybody, and I know this is hard, needs to have a chance, an opportunity. So that's part of the equation. The other part of the equation is people have all said, well, there's plenty of affordable housing in Southwest. We don't need to put any there. And my view of that is, have you seen the affordable housing in Southwest? Not all of it is so great. And so our intention is to not just create affordable housing, but create quality affordable housing that lifts people up, that gives them the ability, if they aren't in housing that they want to be, the option to stay in their own neighborhood and get into better housing. And then the third element of this, which we've partnered with the Atlanta Beltline Partnership on, is to try to figure out a way to crack the code on long-term and permanent affordability, which is an incredibly complex and difficult challenge across our country, and one which we can tell you we have not solved, but is, is a commitment that we're trying to figure out how to make, whether it's you know, tax credit housing or public uh, uh, funded housing, all of those eventually fall out and are then put back into the market. And most of them do not stay in affordable pricing. That's not acceptable. So we're trying to figure out how to create institutions that will allow us to do that. Let me, um, not to be rude to the other questions, but we, we have to call time. Paul and Rob will be here afterwards to answer some additional questions. But uh, please join me in thanking them for their presentation and for their effort. <laughs> And we have a small token of appreciation on behalf of the Urban Health Lecture for uh, Paul and his presentation. And want to wish both you guys the best in your efforts and to involve us in every way possible. So again, thank you for being here. and Thank you for what you're doing for the city of Atlanta. Thank, thank you. And I just want to say we wouldn't actually be here if it hadn't been for the dean and I actually having a meeting in your office two blocks from our office when I first arrived. Yeah as part of a series of one-on-ones uh, one -on I did in the first 100 days. And his first comment to me was, where have you been? <laughs> because we are talking about this all the time. We are trying to be a university that's part of the fabric of the city in a very unique and different way than any other urban university in America. And we believe the Beltline not only provides promise for us, but can help us do our own job better. So we welcome any opportunity we can to help every one of you in what you're trying to do here on campus. And thank you so much for holding our feet to, fi to the fire and making sure that the Atlanta Beltline comes to fruition. Great, thank you. Sure. Thank, you. <laughs> thank you all for coming. <laughs>